Hey folks, it's me, James. Today is June 28th, 2023, and as you may hear, I'm outdoors. And that's because, for all of us north of the equator, it's summer, finally. Today I just want to let you know what I'm up to, and I also have a short episode for you from the vault. So Dakota Spotlight is currently between seasons, so I am just in research and discovery mode at the moment. But we're also working on some changes, potential new changes to the podcast that I'm excited about and I hope to be announcing later this summer or maybe this fall. Now, for those of you who already subscribed to my free newsletter, you already know what a harsh, harsh winter we had here in North Dakota. It really took its toll on everyone, I have to say, myself included. So I'm taking care to get outdoors here when I can to soak up the much needed sun. And hey, if you're not already getting my newsletter, let me tell you how you can sign up. In this newsletter, I try to share some behind the scenes stuff about the podcast, stories, and even just what's going on in my world. For example, this last winter, actually on Valentine's Day, I got stranded in a blizzard and I had to sleep in my car all night. I told readers all about this little adventure in the newsletter. To sign up, go over to inforum.com slash newsletter. That's inforum.com slash newsletter. There you just check the box for Dakota Spotlight's newsletter, about halfway down the page. And hey, choose any other newsletters you want to get. They're all free. Maybe you want to follow Doug Burgum's campaign trail. He's the governor of North Dakota, and he's running for president. There's a newsletter for that, too. Head over to inforum.com slash newsletter. I'm going to get back to my research. Meanwhile, what follows is a podcast segment from my colleague, Trisha Turinskas at The Vault. She published this story in two parts recently, but I've compiled it into one convenient spot for you here. I hope you're having a great summer with plenty of healthy warmth and sunshine. I'll see you later. Here is Trisha with The Vault Podcast. You're listening to The Vault. I'm Trisha Terinskis. For most of Loyal Lundstrom's 20-year marriage to Helen Lundstrom, the couple lived just outside of the quiet southwestern farming city of Montevideo. Together, they had five children. They immersed themselves in the community, which, at the time, had a population of around 6,000. Loyal worked at the same company for 15 years. He served as a member of the school board. He was president of the Montevideo Interdenominational Holiness Camp and a member of the volunteer fire department. But in 1965, when their eldest son joined the Navy, the Lundstrom family picked up their well-manicured life and moved north to Merrifield, Minnesota, where they purchased the then Rainbow Acres Lake Resort on North Long Lake. Merrifield is located near Brainerd, Minnesota, a lake town that hosts cabins and resorts for families throughout the state. It was a summer hotspot, and still is. Once again, in Merrifield, the family became active in the community, with Loyal serving as superintendent of the local church's Sunday school program. Helen taught classes alongside him. And then something tragic happened to the seemingly perfect family. Loyal's wife, Helen, the mother of his five children, was found dead on the resort property. Hours before Helen's death, she and her husband sat at the dining room table, preparing Sunday school lessons for the weekend. It was a normal Saturday night, a weekend ritual for the church leaders. Yet, what came next was anything but routine. According to court documents we obtained, the argument between the couple began in the bedroom, where Helen allegedly bit Loyal on the hand during a near-sexual encounter. Their daughter testified in court that she heard slapping noises coming from the bedroom. She said they were familiar sounds. She'd heard it all before. This was a pattern of behavior. For Loyal. Obviously angry with the situation, on that Saturday night, Helen made her way downstairs to the kitchen to get some air. 
and to get away from her husband. Loyal followed Helen downstairs, and he kept following her. Helen left the house through the kitchen door and made her way to the lake resort's shower and washroom building. She was just trying to get away from him. Still, he followed her. Loyal testified in court that when he got to his wife, she became hysterical and started hitting him. He said he attempted to restrain her and pushed her against the wall with one hand on her neck and one hand on her waist. She jerked back and fell to the floor. Loyal said he thought she had fainted. He said he slapped his wife to revive her, but she didn't wake up. Helen was dead. After failing to find a pulse, Loyal did not call for help. Instead, he testified that he went inside to get dressed and then drove to the Brainerd police station. Once he got there, he told Officer Harold Knutsen that he and his wife had a friendly argument, resulting in his wife's death. He told Knutsen that he loved his wife and he would never hurt her. Despite this, Loyal was eventually arrested and charged with manslaughter for the death of Helen. During the trial, Dr. William Knoll, who conducted the full autopsy on Helen, testified that, according to his medical opinion, Helen died from asphyxiation. Basically, she was strangled. Dr. Knoll painted a picture of Helen's injuries that included bruises on the neck and thighs, as well as congested blood vessels in the brain and diaphragm. No fractures were detected, but Dr. Knoll did indicate there was evidence of hemorrhage in the area around her larynx. In court, Loyal's defense team relied heavily on his perceived character, highlighting his civic accomplishments, church involvement, and testimony from those who had grown close to him, including his pastor. After more than 10 hours of deliberation, the jury found Loyal Lundstrom guilty of first-degree manslaughter. He was given a sentence of up to 15 years in prison and began serving his time at what is now known as Minnesota's Stillwater Correctional Facility. According to Minnesota law, first-degree manslaughter is defined as an act that intentionally causes the harm of another person in the heat of passion, provoked by such words or acts of another as would provoke a person of ordinary self-control under like circumstances. After his sentencing, Loyal began the appeal process. After more than a year, his case made its way to the Minnesota Supreme Court, and in 1969, the court overturned the first-degree manslaughter conviction. In the majority decision, Justice Frank T. Gallagher cited a lack of evidence to establish the intentionality of the incident. Gallagher also stated the indictment presented to the jury was confusing in nature. Essentially, he thought they must have been confused. The Minnesota Supreme Court called for a new trial, but the Crow Wing County Attorney's Office dropped the charges. They cited a lack of new evidence. So, just two years after the death of his wife, Loyal Lundstrom was a free man. He moved to the Minneapolis area with his children, where he worked as a machinist. With his wife dead, he needed help with the children while he worked, so he hired an in-home nanny and eventually married the nanny's daughter, Doris. The couple moved to Texas, where they were married. Loyal and Doris were married in Brown, Texas, on April 4, 1974. Doris was 18 years old at the time. Loyal was 50. The two had five children together. And at the time Doris was murdered, they ranged in ages from 3 to 10. In part two, what the hell happened in Texas? And who killed Doris? 
You've been listening to the. Vault. You're listening to the Vault. This is part two in a two-part series on Loyal Lundstrom. If you haven't listened to part one, I recommend doing that now. It will all make a lot more sense. After marrying in Texas, Loyal and his new 18-year-old bride. Doris, had five children together, adding to the five Loyal had with his late wife, Helen. They settled down in Cisco, Texas. At the time, it had a population of roughly 4,000 people. It was a small rural town, quaint and quiet. Loyal and Doris started two businesses there, the Cisco Motel and Monument Works which created gravestones and other stone structures. James Lundstrom, previously known as Loyal Lundstrom Jr., was the second youngest of the couple's five children. He was seven years old at the time of his mother's murder. I'm going to pause here and take you on a little journey into the process of writing this story. I first spoke with James, Doris and Loyal's son, nearly two years ago, I was writing a story on his father, and I reached out to him along with other family members. James wanted to talk, so we set up a time and did just that. I record all of my interviews, and I did so with James too, but at the time I recorded our interview, I didn't host this podcast or any other, so I didn't ask for permission for his audio to be used in this format. I haven't had luck getting in touch with him again. He did, however, two years ago, give permission for his quotes to be used in the print and web version of the story. So rather than use his audio, I'll be summarizing or reading his quotes. Okay, back to the story. James had fond memories of his mother, Doris. He said she was a warm woman who gave selflessly to her family church, and community. Doris Lundstrom was definitely active. She was a Sunday school teacher, children's church choir director, and president of the PTA. On top of that, she was a hands-on owner and operator of the family businesses. And she had five children, ranging from three to ten. Doris was kind of amazing. And she was a gifted artist. She didn't just run monument works. She created the custom headstones and gravestones. When I spoke with James, he told me that his mother was working on a beautiful gravestone at the time of her death. And that gravestone, that work of art, now sits on her burial plot with her name engraved on the front. Thursday, March 3rd, 1983, started like any other day for the Lundstrom family. Most of the kids went to school, while the youngest stayed with Doris at the hotel she and Loyal managed. But what transpired throughout that day, and the next few days, rocked the small community of Cisco, Texas. Doris's body was found on Saturday, March 5th, 1983, with a shotgun wound to the abdomen. She was found at the Cisco Motel. An autopsy revealed she had been shot and killed two days earlier, on Thursday, March 3rd. On that day, Thursday, March 3rd, Loyal showed up at the home of James Clinton, his pastor, with the couple's three-year-old child. Loyal told him he had to take his wife to visit her injured brother, and he asked that the pastor look after his youngest and the rest of the children when they got home from school. James Clinton agreed, but something about Loyal's story seemed off, and the pastor shared his concerns with close family and friends. On Saturday, March 5th, After not hearing from the couple for two days, the pastor, along with some friends, went to the Cisco Motel, and they discovered Doris's body. (music) 
James, who I spoke to for this story, and his three other siblings were attending school, located just behind the motel, when their mother was shot and killed. When I talked with him, he still remembered the day when he learned his mother was murdered and the realization that life would never be the same. After the pastor found Doris's body, law enforcement was alerted, and eventually they located Doris's vehicle, her 1982 Chrysler New Yorker, at the Dallas Fort Worth airport. But they didn't know where Loyal was. After more than two weeks on the run, he was apprehended after exiting an incoming flight. He was charged with first degree murder for the death of Doris Lundstrom. The trial for that murder didn't end well for Loyal. His defense attorney argued that Doris simply fainted after Loyal pointed the gun at her. It was an unlikely story and somewhat reminiscent of the one Loyal told decades earlier regarding his first wife, Helen. The jury deliberated for 45 minutes before returning a guilty verdict. Loyal was sentenced to life in prison, and this time, all of his appeal attempts failed. In the wake of his mother's murder, James and his siblings stayed with their grandfather in Texas before eventually moving in with their mother's brother. Her brother, their uncle, was serving active duty in the military, so they moved around a lot, and they finally settled in Osceola, Wisconsin. As James got older, he began questioning what really happened between his parents. He still remembers the day he learned his father was the one who murdered his mother, and he said he was shocked. At that time, it seemed out of character. You might be wondering now if all those who grew close to Loyal knew that he had gotten off the hook for the death of his first wife. The answer is, we don't know for sure. There was obviously no internet back then, so it was somewhat reasonable to assume he was able to relocate to a small, rural Texas town without anyone knowing. But what about Doris's mom and dad? After all, Doris's mother was Loyal's nanny for the first set of five children back in Minnesota. Doris's parents, Fred and Bernice, actually relocated from Minnesota to the Texas area to be closer to their daughter and her young family. Considering they lived in Minnesota during the time of Loyal's manslaughter trial for the death of Helen, James wonders, suspects even, that his grandparents followed his mom to Texas to keep an eye on her and to keep an eye on Loyal. Fred died in 2002. James said he never did ask his grandfather why he moved to Texas, or if and what he knew about his dad's past. Loyal Lundstrom died in prison on May 1st, 2007. He was 77 years old. Months before his death, James traveled to Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas, with two older sisters. He went with a mission to find out what happened on March 3rd, 1983, and why. He didn't find the answers he was looking for. His father was dying from complications associated with Alzheimer's disease and wasn't capable of explaining. The answers to the questions, held by so many who knew Loyal, went unanswered. To read the full version of this story and more, head to inforum.com slash the vault. This episode was written and produced by me, Trisha Terinskis. The Vault's editor is Jeremy Fugelberg. If you like what you hear on The Vault, do us a favor and give us a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening.